Welcome to the AV Huddle, the place for AV professionals to get the latest news, updates and stories from the leading commercial manufacturers and suppliers. Hear from end users while we dive into new technology, business strategy and innovative ways AV is shaping the sector. Let's jump into the huddle. Hi, good morning everybody and welcome to another edition of the AV Huddle. And today we have a different co-host than probably what you've been used to. And I'll let him intro himself. We have Jack. Jack, do you want to give a quick intro? Hi, um, I'm Jack Hargreaves. I work at AVM um, in the finance department. And we have our special guest today, Paul Bamba from PJ3 Projects. And he might even have a, one of his own little special guests to join along as well, um, a little puppy, um, Billy. So I think you can hear someone in the background. It's not um, Paul's squeaky chair. Uh, Paul, no. a, because Paul, Paul's been in IT, uh, in particular property. IT and property for the last 24 years, and he's worked on various different projects, um, averaging from about 30 million. I think, you know, uh, one he's talked about recently is about 140,000 square feet with all sorts of stuff going on around about, you know, IT, smart buildings, and I guess to AV technology. So I've probably done a really poor intro of Paul, but I'd like Paul to fill in the gaps and you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, Paul, and what you do, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, cheers. Um... Yeah, I'm Paul Bamba. So for the past 20 years, I've led an IT function for um, a, a property uh, development company. Um, but for the probably for the past two or three years, I've started to really start to focus in on uh, digital twins and smart buildings, um, because you could see the impact that that would have on commercial offices. Um, so I've really started to become almost obsessed with that over the last two years. And like you just said, we've we, we managed to develop it so far to uh, see if we could actually build a smart enabled building. Um, and the proxy for that was a was a new build in Birmingham, Enterprise Wharf. Um, so we were really going to see if we could take the the learnings that we've done in the last two years and actually could we physically build one. So that's that's where we're at at, at, at this moment in time. Well, wow, okay. So and um, so in terms of you know your kind of like a. I'll call you you're an expert in the field because you know a lot more than I think most people can even do for so long. You know, tell us more about smart buildings because I think when people think of smart buildings, it's a bit difficult. You know, is it like windows that open themselves? You know, is it you know what what is it? What, what is a smart building and, and why do people want a smart building? That's my other question. Well, I, I think the interesting thing for me has been it's almost started at home. It started with home smart buildings. Um, as people have started to put, you know, like hive devices in to better control the heating, um, smart thermostatic radiator valve so that you can isolate rooms better, um, ring, you know, your doorbell, you've got much better understanding of your home security. Um, and all really smart buildings is, is almost scaling that up to enterprise level. It's about, because whereas at home, you put all that technology in to make your life easier, basically, because yeah. you want to remotely control your heating. You want to have a look at the CCTV in the garden. You know, let's say we, we've just got a new dog. You know, you can get puppy cams. Is the puppy OK? You know, it's just to make your life easier. And all smart buildings for me is 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 just scaling that up in the, in the enterprise level. So I always looked at smart buildings across three areas, one uh, being operational efficiency, uh, user experience and sustainability. Uh, obviously, sustainability is a huge driver for this at the moment, as we know, with, with global warming, uh, people are trying to do the right thing. And I think if you're a property owner, um, I think, you know, you have an absolute obligation to run your building in the most efficient manager, uh, the most efficient manner possible um, to, and to use all the technology and the systems available to us. It's exactly the same way you manage your home. You know, you, you, you know, you, you buy a hive and you'll get a monthly report about how efficient you've been with your heating this month. And it almost challenges you. I do. I'm, I'm working at home all the time, as a lot of us are at COVID. I'm thinking, do I need the heating on? I might just put a hoodie on rather than turning the heating on. Because when you've got access to the data, you become much more aware. And I think mm, yeah. once you're more aware, you try and make those savings that perhaps you wouldn't have done if you weren't, if you weren't aware of it. So I think smart buildings just brings a better awareness depending on um who you represent are you the, are you the property owner are you the landlord are you the operator are you the customer and i think smart buildings is a bit of a general term it is and we, we're almost trying to stop using that term um, um, um because it's so it, it means different things to different people but it's basically it's just serving data making you more insightful no matter 
what part of that um, user experience you represent. Yeah. So how, you know, how, how would it work, especially if you're a commercial building, you know, I'm assuming you wouldn't just use off the shelf kind of commercial equipment like, you know, Alexa or something like that, you know, it's probably <laughs> other devices, isn't it? Or would you, you know, you, you tell me, you know, how, how would it work? I'm trying to think of this on a larger scale. Is it that simple? Um, in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, I think I've spent probably, I probably spent 12 months going to two events a week because prop tech just took off. So it was just such a massive market and bear in mind property has innovated very little probably over the past 20 years, mm. uh, probably even more than that. You know, I think um, a lot of property owners have, have got away for a long time with, you know, basically creating a, a really smart reception. You put a really smart team behind it that meet and greet you. And then you create um, grade A offices, you know, you create great um, specification of offices. And that was it. You know, you built that generally people would come. And then you would secure, you know, a 20 year lease. That was certainly the case when I first started um, in, in, in a property back in 95, 96. Um, but now that that's just not the case. I think now the voice of the customer is so much more, um, is so strong, you know, um, customers want flexibility. You're not going to get somebody in on a 20 year lease anymore. It might be five to seven year annual lease, uh, lease term now. So you've got to provide much more of, a, of an experience for customers. And, you know, there's some great sayings out there. Anthony Slumbers is a, you know, just to paraphrase him, you know, he'd say, we're no longer selling products, you're selling services. And I think when you start to think of it like that, it completely changes the, the way that you design now and you build your product because customers now are expecting um, breakout space. They're expecting to be able to run in and, and cycle, they're expecting bike racks and showers. Um, you know, they're expecting um, gyms, you know, yoga studios. Uh, they're expecting to basically work securely anywhere within the building. So a lot of our um, buildings now, you know, the, the, certainly the ground floor, they, we give up that that's non-rental, um, you know, space to us. It's given up to breakout areas and co-working desks, and it's just giving, it's just giving that flexibility. Um, and again, I think COVID has really forced this agenda as well, because now people are coming in and they, they yeah, you've got to now ensure that you can get people in the building safely. And perhaps, you know, perhaps we'll cover this in a little bit more detail later on. But it, it, you, when people are in the building, because you, you spend 90 percent of your day indoors, don't forget. And that's quite frightening. So, again, going back to a landlord's requirement, if somebody's in your building for a large part of their day, eight or nine hours of the day, it's your responsibility to make sure that the air quality is good and that they've got access to, you know, natural light and fresh air and they've got a good level of ventilation and filtration in the air. And all these things have really started to matter. You know, I think the well certification has been fantastic for raising the awareness of that. But I think COVID will, will certainly drive a few other um, agendas around how safe am I? How safe is this environment I'm going to work in? Um, you know, I think the data behind that is really interesting. And I think we're getting to that point now where certainly users of space are going to come in now and want, want that guarantee. They're going to want to know what the air quality is like. If me, if me, you and Jack were sat and having this in, in person in a four person meeting room inside half an hour, if that room wasn't um, well ventilated or we didn't have visibility of that data, we might start to feel a little bit, you know, we get say an hour in and we might say, well, perhaps we need to have a break guys. Cause you know, feeling a bit tired, I need a coffee, but actually that might be nothing to do with, with me as an individual. It might just be something to do with the environment that we're sat in. But yeah. sorry, to go back to your original question, how do you do it? Is it, is it Alexa's? Uh, so that's, I get very excited and I run off down a few rabbit holes. <laughs> no, it's fine though. Pull me back in a little bit. But, <laughs> but my, my vision of us for a smart building has always been based around a pyramid. So um, it, the bottom level of that pyramid um, is, is what we would call smart enablement. It's, it's enabling the building so that it can, um, but it's future-proofed. So um, getting all the things in that you need to get in at the start of that build that are, that's difficult to retrofit in. So make sure you've got the right uh, main equipment room, the comms room, make sure you've got the containment and the comms um, and the risers suitably, um, you know, suitably sized. Make sure you've got fibre run to all the floors and you've still got copper run to all the floors. So you've got the ability basically to provide services to any floor within that building. 
and then looking at all of your building subsystems. So looking at your BMS, which has obviously been around as the brain of the building for forever, but making sure that that built that BMS is, um, is an, it's open protocol. It's an intelligent BMS so that it can start to pull in data from the lift, from the air, um, from the HVAC solution, from the uh, CCTV, from the access control. You want, you want to basically any system that you put in, you want to make sure it's open and it's accessible um, and that can perhaps connect to um, a centralized landlord um, converging network so that you've got a simplified way of providing services to that, to that, to that building. And everybody's not running their own uh, BT line to the CCTV and then somebody's got their own fiber run to the, uh, to some other, to the lift system. Uh, Cause you'll, you'll see that, you know, You'll, you'll see that in an average building now. If you wanted to look at the, 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 the lift system, you go into one room and the CCTV is in another room and then you've got a boiler room that's got all the other information about the heating and the ventilation. It's all done in silos. And I think mm. if, you're, if your aim and objective is to build a smarter building, then you have to make sure you don't, you don't allow these silo, siloed systems to, ex, to exist. And you'll still get a few people folding their arms because they're protecting... A lot of their a lot of their proprietary systems, but you've just got to encourage people now to to be a little bit more sensible when they're when they're not only building a new one, but when they're perhaps retrofitting uh, an existing building because that's just as important. You know, we're, we're not just building new buildings; it has to be retrofitable. So if you get the opportunity to go in and do a refurb on a reception or a re, you know reasonably significant in, intervention, then have a look at some of the really key systems like your BMS, like your HVAC. And just try and encourage them to, to to buy or encourage them to procure a system that's open and interoperable with, with with other systems so if you get that right then the second layer to that pyramid is where you can start creating the experiences and you can start to look at right if, if we wanted to focus on improving the user experience what did we want to do well we might want an app that allows people to um, digitally sign our visitors in and then they can come in with a qr code and they can pass through the speed lane so if you've got the enablement in place you've then got a really great opportunity to create some quite interesting and exciting experiences and those experiences might be around operational efficiency they might be around user experience they might be around sustainability but if you get the enablement piece right that that bottom layer then it just gives you a really great opportunity to 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 create things now and in the future um, and i think that's what some of the really great smart exemplar buildings have done so because if you just say built a, a smart enable building five years ago could you have preempted all the requirements for covid yeah now you know and that say increased in cleaning regimes whereas if you've got um a, a sensibly enabled building you could go and put occupancy sensors on your toilets you could go and put sensors on the toilet rolls because you would already have the interface or the that middle layer in place to just seamlessly connect the um, systems back to some kind of um, a platform that could read this data uh, and make sense of it. And somebody is more uh, insightful as a, as a, as a result of that. And then the top of the pyramid for me is, is the data, it's the insights, it's the, it's the dashboards, it's the, all the information that perhaps people haven't got now, but um, you know, if you surface people, uh, if you service brilliant people with brilliant data, you're going to you're going to have a you know a really well run facility that customers are going to want to be in, uh, and more importantly, they're not going to want to leave because why would you leave a smart building? That's that's my big sell. Build a smart building, you'll fill it, you'll be able to charge more rent, and nobody will want to move out of it. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to say the first thing when you start talking about a triangle, I thought hopefully he's not going into some sort of Illuminati there, talking about a triangle. <laughs> but then um, you mentioned really going really off topic here now. But did you say sensors on toilet rolls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It exists. Does it? Um, oh, okay. Smart cleaning um, has been around for for quite a long time, but it it was more um, it has a it has a posher word. It might come to me. Uh, but it's essentially it's just being smarter about how you clean uh, but it was yeah. more done in, in big larger facilities like airports and hospitals um you know where, where you've got many many you know um, yes. toilets yeah. and stuff so in a way it's just about making sure your cleaning operatives are more efficient yeah, yeah. by having data available to them because i i saw it in the gym um 
recently, I was sat down, not doing too much, which is pretty typical for me in the in the gym, looking for any distraction possible. I, I watch the Jack cleaning. Here. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> I, wa- I watch one of the one of the team members there go from one bin to the next bin to the next next bin, and would have been back full of just empty, you know, Lucas A bottles and the like. It's that it's just making sure that doesn't happen. But if you imagine scaling that up to a, a hundred, and, you know, what's the most efficient way you can clean? Well, the obvious thing is you just have a simple sensor that tells you when the bin is full, or a simple sensor that tells you now, particularly with with COVID, if there's no soap. How many times have you been to a restaurant and we're all very yeah. paranoid about it now? And you want to do the right thing and you come out and you go, oh, it's empty. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Ah. and then you quickly get over it, don't you? And you, you leave it, but. You don't want that to happen now. If you to bring, if you want to bring people back into your buildings and and and, and convince them that it's safe to do so, it's your responsibility to make sure that experience doesn't happen. So it, 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 it's there. You know, there's plenty of people out there that are doing it, and it, but it's just a really simple way of improving not only the operational efficiency because potentially you might need less people for less time, but it improves the user experience. So it's great. You know, why why wouldn't you invest in that? And then the other one is obviously the toilet roll. You know, there's a, there's a, the sensors in the toilet roll that'll tell you if it's full, if it's medium, if we're at risk, or if it's run out. You should never run out. You know, and, and it, it just sounds like a daft thing, doesn't it? We've yeah. all been there. Uh, but you know, if we can just put a simple sensor on it, that then when the cleaning uh, operative is, is close, you can say, actually, I don't need to go to this first set of um, toilets. I go to the second set because I know two of the toilet rolls are running really low and there's no soap. So. They, they, they can uh, they can go in and deal with that. But then the beauty of it is, if you're also doing things like water temperature testing, then why not? While while light operatives on the third floor, for instance, say actually the the end toilet rot the end toilet block isn't re- reused very much. So while you're there, can you also just run the toy run the tap or whatever it needs to be doing to perhaps lower your uh, risk of legionnaires and make sure you've got your water temperature testing right. So then. Again, that 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 person isn't just cleaning. Yeah. They're also thinking to themselves, "Wow, I'm I'm also fixing other things while I'm here." You know, if they've got visibility of that data, yeah, yeah. that type of thing is it, it, it's really simple to do because yeah. the sensor technologies come down, come down. I, so. I'd say that's really interesting because you're taking you know one data and potentially pairing it with another piece of data, and it's like one plus one is kind of equaling three um, yeah. because you're you're. If you looked at them independently, it might not mean much, but when you look at it together, it gives you something you probably weren't able to see before. Um, and essentially, so that's, that's what you're kind of suggesting, you know, with, with smart enabled buildings is people might be just, you know, putting blinkers on thinking about all I can see is just, for example, how much toilet rolls left in this example. But yeah. at the same time, you're looking at operational efficiencies. Um, you know, you talked about water legionnaires and pulling in other data and saying, actually, if somebody's doing a particular task in this location, not because it's a toilet roll, but because of that task, yeah. they could be doing something else that's going to save uh, time, but also improving experience. Well, the, the other thing you can do from an operational efficiency is a lot of these facilities, and you'll see when you go to the cinema or anywhere, you'll see a little board that says it's been cleaned every hour. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other way to do it, again, from an operational efficiency is do it per 70 visits or per 80 visits, whatever the yeah. agreed SLA is with the customer. So it means that... Yeah. If, you know, it's like on a Friday, if that floor is not used or it's not been utilized, then it might not get clean because it's not hit the amount of um, amount of visits. So, again, it's just about being using the data to be more insightful as a result so that you're more operationally efficient as a person and you know, you, you're being a little bit more effective in, in, in what it is that you do. But the yeah. same the same kind of thing goes for a lot of other facilities in a building. Lifts are another example, again, forever lifts just get they're on a plan preventative maintenance schedule for and they'll get serviced every six months or every 12 months whatever it is but you might find that two of your four lifts are used much more just because of the way perhaps the traffic flows in yeah two of the lifts are used all the time um, whereas one of the lifts perhaps isn't used as much but they'll all get serviced at the same time so you're paying for you're paying for replaceable parts when, when in fact it might not need to have been serviced at that point because if you've got better data on how much that lift has been used and utilized and actually yeah. how much the equipment is is in need of being serviced because you can be much more, much more specific now with the data that you can get out of a lot of this mechanical um, equipment, then 
actually you might have these things service less but it doesn't actually impact the um the, the you know the dwell time it doesn't impact the operational experience sorry the, yeah. it doesn't impact the uh, user experience because actually it doesn't need replacing it doesn't need to be taken out of for the morning to be to be serviced as often so it's just again it's just about connecting up um key elements of that build of that building um and making sure that we're using data yeah to, um to, to to you know service them as and when it needs to be done so it's just about thinking differently i think that that that's the key bit you know if you're a if you're a building manager it's about thinking differently and i think that for me has been the biggest challenge because people have set ways of working um, and people are very um they're very wary of technology they're very wary of, of a sensor because they think yeah. you're going to replace them but actually what you need is brilliant data with brilliant people to provide a brilliant service and i think yeah. that that has such a big impact on the user experience because what we know for sure is that the most important thing for our customers um, is that they have a, uh, a building that doesn't fail. They have a building mm. that works well for them and provides them with the experiences they want. So yeah. if we're in charge of operating that space, then we have to think differently. We can't be reactive. We have to be proactive. So why can't we use the, the concepts of a smart building to get in front of a lot of these um, issues, uh, you know, be, be more proactive? Because for me, um, the SLA should always be um, if if a customer logs a call we didn't know about, we failed. And I think yeah. that should be how people check in every day. You know, they should be thinking that, um, you know, that it, it's that classic thing. We should have people checking less things, but fixing more things. Yeah. And whether that fixing is preventative or reactive, let's free up people to do the stuff that matters yeah. rather than just checking the water temperature checking the emergency lighting checking that thing you know like what what can we automate those repetitive yeah. tasks are going to be automated yeah. by machines so let's get them forgetting about that think differently how can you add value to the customer or yeah. how can you make the building more operationally efficient but yeah that thinking differently thing i think still for me it 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 it, it, it needs a little bit more work but that's why i try and do as pj3 uh, as pj3 projects is to try and take people on that journey and get them to understand really what the value of um, what the value of smart is. Yeah. Cause I think from what you explained there, it got me thinking about, you know, my, my car. Um, so I've got BMW and in there, they work on, you know, measuring sensors from brakes and brake fluids and, you know, servicing. And when you say, you know, what needs servicing, they always say, well, the car will tell you cause they, they measure what's happening. And I remember initially when I was doing lots of motorway miles, I'd bring it for a service and the guy took my key fob and be like, Oh, you know, your brake pads are fine, but you just need to, you know, it seems to be doing loads of miles. I was like, how do you know that? And he goes, we, we've got all the data. Yeah. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a call saying, oh, by the way, you know, your car is due for a brake fluid service. And they were being proactive in kind of calling me up and saying, it's coming up soon in a few weeks, you know, don't forget to do it. And I think it's amazing use of data. And they've really kind of taken that to the next level instead of saying, oh, you've got a service every six months. It's depending on how often you use I yeah. don't know, which part of your car. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's great what you're saying because it's using that kind of analogy within smart buildings and you know not wasting somebody's time and do it for the sake of doing it but doing it when you really need to do it if you're a property manager that that that's how you need to think because like you said yeah. you don't need to take your car in every 12 months or every x miles now really yes, you're almost yeah. being told to come in you something in the car will tell you oh the brake pads now are, yeah. are low uh, you know yeah. and it's that level of of insight that we just need to take into our built environment to become you know um a little bit uh, more efficient in what we do um because yeah. i mean is that going to cost the garages any more do you think bmw going to lose any money out of that but are you a happier customer in a bmw probably yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Do, do you see um because you, you, you mentioned there you know that one of the challenges well, i've got a couple of questions coming off the back of what you just said is one you know because it's new a lot of people are probably not aware of what is possible so you know, how would somebody listening to this thinking, oh, okay, smart building sounds interesting, but what can I do with it? Because it seems to be a lot going on. Like, you know, what are the use cases or the scenarios where something can be applied that's going to benefit somebody? You know, where do you start with all of this? Because it just seems like, you know, lots of data, lots of sensors, lots of things, but what would I, where would I begin? You know, what would I do? How can I make better experiences? Well, that, that I think is the, 
that's the mo the really interesting question because you'll ask a different question depending on what user class you represent. So if you're um, a building owner and an investor, um, you're going to perhaps be looking at um, how can that building be run for less? How can it be more sustainable? How can we use less energy? Um, I think certainly um, sustainability is a massive driver. The UK Green Building Council are really driving awareness for this and you know really driving this forward. So if you're a building owner now, you know, 20, by 2030, I'll probably get this wrong, but all new builds are certainly going to be net zero carbon in operation. And then there's there's further um, you know targets for 2050 where all existing buildings will be net zero carbon, but all new buildings will have to be net zero carbon in their whole life uh, and their whole carbon life cycle. So you've got some really big um, targets from a sustainability yeah. perspective. And if you're not investing in sustainable technology, you're less likely. I, you know, I think there's, there's there's plenty of evidence to to even get funding. So you might not even get funding to to build that building if you're wow. building a dumb building. So there you go. There's the big one. If it's not yeah. smarter and it's not sustainable, you might yeah. not get the, the cash to build it. If wow. you build it, it might be worth less, probably will be worth less than the one next door. So again, you, you, you're you losing that kind of value and that yield in the building. So that's a big one. But and if you're a and if you're a developer, um, you know, and if you're an operator, you know, those two guys need to come together. Um, and I think that's what we've seen on the on, on the Brumwood SciTech project that we've done for Enterprise Wharf when we've got that through to Reba Stage Two, you know, that early planning stage. We've got the guys that we're going to build it that represent the client, and we've also got the operator in the room to say, right, when we build it, then let, let's chat together to make sure that all the services that that you provide are going to help me um, run the building for the next 30 years. Because you get the guy that might take three or four years to build it, yeah. gets it to practical completion, moves on to his next project. And yeah. then he, he hands the keys basically over to a guy that's like, I've got to run this now for 30 years, whatever it might be. Um, you know, is it, is it is it built to the right specification? Can he, yeah. can he create these experiences that the customers want now? You know, it, you know like COVID, for instance, is a really interesting one. Um, again, it's from a... So if you look, look back to your, to your original question, why do it? Um, you know, if you're a building operator and you're a customer, you, 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 you've got to prove to people that you can get them into the building safely and securely. So all of a sudden, the whole contactless experience has become, has become hugely important. And again, we've been working with, with, with you guys, AVM, at one of uh, Brunwood Works uh, pioneer projects at Piccadilly, so that people now don't even want to touch a screen to, bring a, to, to turn a screen on. Uh, or touch a panel to, to turn the heat on it, it people are even even uncomfortable with things like that so how can you create that experience via perhaps a qr code that then passes all the control to your to your mobile phone can you do it yeah you can do it because you guys you guys did it in a, in a matter of, of days at piccadilly when that became a real um you know potential problem for our customers right well what's the reaction let's create a contactless experience for that but if you've not got joined up systems, so at, 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 for instance, at Piccadilly, we've got AV equipment that's open protocol, but we've also got a brand new BMS system that's just gone in there that allows the AV equipment to also interface with the with the HVAC and the cooling in the room. So your interface can not only operate your AV equipment, but it can also operate the heat and it can also operate the blinds without touching anything that's not your own. So for me, wow. that, that that's a fantastic experience. And I think people... Are going to really um, going to really appreciate that because they're going to move into those offices and use those meet rooms and think this this customer's really thought about what's important to me right now um, and you know they're trying to keep me safe and I can come here and feel safe um, um, as long as you know they're they're, they're exercising their um, social distancing rules when they're moving around the space obviously um, but we've done everything we can to make sure that they're feeling safe coming back into the to the to the building, which I think is amazing. We shouldn't overlook things like that. But then there's, if you're again going back to to how you operate that building, you know, should we be investing in uh, real time energy energy management? I think it's it, again being driven by 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 the sustainability. Um, you know, this is about transforming the way we own, we manage, and we use, and we buy energy by continuously monitoring um, its consumption. You know, if you then add things like occup occupancy sensors in there as well, 
you can start to really pinpoint abnormal energy consumption. Um, you know, you can really pinpoint where that fault might be, thus avoiding costly energy spikes, uh, expensive equipment failures, whatever it might be, just by thinking differently and saying, actually, I'm not just going to pay the utilities bill every month. Like we're all guilty of doing at home. It comes in and sometimes you go, bloody hell, um, it, it, it's a bit expensive this month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, God, I bet she's had the eating on when I've been, you know, but it, it's yeah. that process. But if you scale that up to, you know, many, you know, thousand, a couple of hundred thousand square feet, even then you can make massive savings if you've got data that tells you, yeah. if you, you can feed that hot water, you know, the utility metering um, into some kind of a algorithm, a machine learning algorithm in some kind of great platform, then you can, you can really start to make some efficiency recommendations based on, how your tenants are behaving and actual building usage and start to probably forecast what the usage will be tomorrow, next week, depending on how warm it is, how cold it is, the time of the year, by how many people are in the building. And then I think you can really start to pinpoint, uh, like I say, where can you make savings? This doesn't feel right. There might be a leak. Is that, you know, why is the energy on? Actually, why is it coming on at four o'clock in the morning? It, it needs to come on at six and we can still hit the target temperature by coming on a couple of hours late. So, but without that kind of open protocol systems and without those great platforms, you're never going to have that kind of insightful data, are you? But then even if you put that in and there's, there's, there's quite a lot out there at the moment, there are some really great um, building energy management systems out there, uh, but don't underinvest in the customer training and support, you know, teach your people how to use and how to best utilize this technology because these predictive analytics and the, performance optimization and nothing without great people to understand the insight. So take people on the journey so that they're not um, almost, um, you know, they're not going to worry that you're, you're trying to replace them or automate yeah. them. You're not, yeah. you're just trying to make them more brilliant. Um, yeah, that, I think, that, I think, I think you, really you kind of, yeah. Sorry, Paul. Um, I thought no, I was going to say. Really you, bit. And then, yeah. well, you know, research at the moment, I've just been reading something by JLL more sustainable buildings have an increased rental value. They're saying between six and 11%. Wow. Well, there you go. Let's let, it's worth the punt, isn't it? Because yeah. the other thing that I found that the, the biggest challenge is that there's not always a really clear business case sometimes for doing these things because yeah. it's quite new and nobody's got five year data on running that smart lighting or that integrated BMS. So you're struggling almost to, 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 to it's becoming a little bit clearer and a lot more people are investing time into the research, but it's not always a brilliant um, business case for it. Sometimes it might feel like a bit of a gamble. That's where your stakeholder management comes in. You know, that's yeah, where you've yeah. got to go in and say, this is the right thing to do. Um, and then, you know, with, with some certainty, I think we can say it is the right thing to do. But it, it, it's an interesting question. And I know I've talked very at length about the response to it. But that's where I get quite excited because if you're going to sit, say, in a workshop and understand how smart buildings are going to work for you, then you need everybody that represents different parts of the build of the business because who's going to drive the agenda? Yeah. Uh, and that's always the really interesting thing. And you don't want it only to be about return on investment because it's, it, don't get me wrong, it's a significant part of it. But what about if it just really improves the user experience? Then is there's value in making, you know, keeping customers, retaining them. You don't want them to move from your smart enabled building. Yeah, and I think I was going to just kind of go back to what you said earlier with your kind of, you know, your first level of the pyramid, where yeah. actually, if you look at this right from the beginning, you can plan for the future. And if you got, you know, the infrastructure right, at the same time, get user buy-in, stakeholder, who's going to operate this, who is it for, and get all the different kind of key players or users uh, right from the beginning, it can work really well, instead of just thinking about it in silos and saying, right, I, I want to do this. I think that's where you're coming from. And that's why I understand that actually, you know, smart building has multiple different kind of aspects to it. But at the same time, you need to bring in everybody together to make it work. Because as you said, if you just purely look at ROI, you're going to discount everybody else. And actually, by just discounting everybody else, you might not even get the ROI. You yeah. know, so the ROI might sound good, but actually if you don't have the user experience, they're not going to come in and you're not going to rent it out. Um, you know, or if you don't think about sustainability, you're not going to kind of, you know, hit them targets and you might not even get the funding to help you with the ROI. So I think what you're, what you're understanding, you know, there's lots of different uh, Venn diagrams, let's call it, where they all yeah. overlap and they yeah. help each other out. There is, and the, the biggest challenge and that something that really bothered me when I started to look at this two years ago, which was it felt like a very technology led 
project and I don't like that you know because it will only ever take you so far because at some point somebody's going to say well who's it for who's going to benefit from it yeah um, and because there's lots of very obvious things you need to do like say that's why the enablement layer is the most is the most key area that's the bit that we've been doing for years and years and years but it just needs to be looked at and procured slightly differently with the future in mind rather than just the now you know every yes. building needs lifts access yeah. control hvac and bms but it does it does but let's just make sure that it's ready for the future and that that's that's the key bit and then and then you can stop the the technology driven part and then the really interesting bit, like you say, is engaging with all the different user, uh, all the different user classes and saying, what does it mean for you? You know, and that we spend a lot of time doing all those, those user stories. So as a customer, I'd, I'd like to be able to book the meeting room or, you know, as a, as a customer, I'd like to know if there was no hot water because I cycle in. So could you let me know? So then I might not cycle in or yeah. as a person that runs in. I'd like to know what the shower utilization is like because it, it seemingly every time I come in, the showers are busy. So can you tell me when they're less busy? Um, so again, just really simple um, um, examples of, of, of a user story depending on yeah. what kind of a, a user class you are. So a building manager might say, I want to know um, at any given time how many people there are in the building. Again, a COVID um, relevant uh, data, data stat for you. Um, you know, how many people in the building? So then as you're as you're trying to encourage people to come back into the building, um, you might start to ramp up the cleaning as as occupancy increases. And then the simple thing, like if you're going to put on a guy that's going to come in and say a pizza van, which we sometimes you know you see, sometimes see, or a coffee guy comes in, or you're going to hold an event, AVM want to hold an event to to, to sell their um, services. The building manager could say, "Come in on a Tuesday because Tuesday's our busiest day." It's just really simple things like that where yeah. sometimes we get it wrong, um, but Again, it's just to get about getting people to think differently. Technology led takes you so far, and I think you can surface some interesting stats. At some point, it's it's got to then transfer over to the to, to the users of the space, the people that operate the space, the people that build the space to say, do you know what would be really useful for me, Paul? Is could you tell me how many people are in the building? Um, where where are they getting out? You know, on what floor are they getting out? And is it possible to turn a lift off? when uh, uh, um, say at four o'clock when there's very little um, footfall because if we turn a lift off that doesn't affect the uh, user experience actually the energy savings we make are x brilliant let, let what a great use case let's go away and, and figure out is that what we can do because not only does it make you more operationally efficient but the customers would love that kind of the customers yeah. would love yeah. that kind of initiative because yeah. i think these guys are really on it you know they're really using data they're really using technology but there's a there's an output there's a there's a green output from that yeah. Um, so yeah it, it it it's fascinating and then if you go, go. were able to translate that data into something that the users could see as well the end yeah. users were able to see they'll see the actual benefits of the things that they were contributing towards by being part of that building wouldn't they oh massively massively i don't know if you've ever been in um a well accredited building and, uh, well, an office, um, but I, I I have this one in Neo. Um, I can't remember the name. Uh, it'll come to me. Um, and I went into their offices and you get out the lift and you know they've got a well-certified office. So they've got air quality that, that that's just perfectly regulated. There's no VOCs. You know, everything that they've done is with the user experience in mind and the user well-being in mind. Honestly, the lifts opened and I felt like it was the sound of music. I got out and I felt like I was on the top of a mountain. I was like, I feel amazing in here because even though it might not have been, because I knew that they'd invested in the technology and they were exemplars of it, uh, it was just, it, I just felt, I felt so much better. But like you say, Jack, you're absolutely right. So if, if for instance, a company creates meeting rooms and breakout space where they're advertising on some kind of a, of a community board, you know, that they bought from AVM, obviously, you know, a nice big uh, digital screen, um, you know, that, that says, you know, the air quality here is absolutely optimal. Um, and it's the equivalent to being stood in uh, Lime Park. Yeah. You know, you know, you can make those comparisons. Yeah. Um, or the energy we've saved today is, is the equivalent of taking 70 cars off the road. So like you say, you're right, yeah. Jack, you're just about interpreting something that nobody understands to something that they do understand. Yeah. yeah. And the only reason you're seeing this screen is because you're within 80% of the footfall for this day. Yeah. So, 
otherwise the screen would be off. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes great sense. I think um, the other thing you mentioned, Paul, earlier was, you know, impact of COVID and how it's changing the landscape of smart buildings and how they're being used. Um, so that kind of, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask you earlier was actually, you know, how is COVID impacting smart buildings or office buildings or, you know, any other commercial space, but also leading on from that is where do you see the future of smart buildings and, you know, what dynamics are you seeing, you know, from your experience, you know, within the sector related to smart buildings, you know, where's it, where's it going? Right. Let me just write that down. Cause I know I'll start answering one and then won't go and cut to the other. <laughs> I think COVID, um, COVID has had a huge impact, certainly on, on commercial offices. You, you know, you, you occupy one. I used to, you'll see footfall has dropped right off as the, obviously the, the, the government, uh, message was to stay at home don't don't go in and then obviously that's changed over time if you can go in please go in um but i think what's happened the fundamental change has been that people have figured out that they can work from home productively um, i'm sure you've always worked from home productively as of high as of i but the, the the big shift has been whereas certain perhaps sectors say call centers that was yeah. never an option for them Whereas you in marketing, I'm sure you know you 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 work from home all the time. Poor Jack has to go in every day, I'm sure, because <laughs> uh, his finance and they tend to be run by people a bit old school and they like to see people sat at the desk. That's how they measure productivity. Sure, that's not the case with uh, you guys, but that's generally the case, isn't it? I don't think anybody would disagree with that. So then all that happened overnight was that people work from home, and then what happened the next day? They realised they were reasonably productive, and then what happened the next month? They thought, I'm actually really loving this. I don't want to go back to the office because no matter what, obviously certain engineering and the certain obviously sectors that that doesn't apply to, but but for the majority of people working in say conventional office, then then it is you could work home productively. So all of a sudden the switch then was when you could go back into the office, people were like, Well, why do I want to come back in the office? Because if I come in even for three days of the week, I've got to buy a weekly tram pass or I've got to buy a monthly train pass. I don't want to have that expenditure. I then got to spend my money in a sandwich shop in, in, in the middle of the city centre, and it's expensive. So all of a sudden, my living costs go up again for, for no reason. I don't, I don't want to or need to come into the office. So whereas previously you would have had to have asked permission to work from home, you're now almost seeking um, the reason why for you to go into the office. So there's been, a, there's been a fundamental shift in how people have worked. And I think that's what people are going to really struggle with certain businesses are going to struggle to get people back in the office because they've not got a compelling enough reason to go back in. Now, there are plenty of reasons, don't get me wrong, to go back in. I think people are missing the human connection. I think uh, certainly if I was starting a new role in a business, I would feel a little bit, well, I'd probably feel a lot disconnected from, from the business because it's great sitting with people because that's when you hear them, how they are on the phone and you have that, you know, do you want to come out for some lunch? Oh, you like running, do you? Do you want to fancy coming out running tomorrow? You've got a dog, have you? Oh, you know, you know what I mean? That's where you pick. You don't get that if you're having, you know, just Teams meetings about very specific things. So I do get that. But I think we'll eventually, we'll, 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 we'll work that out. There'll either be something from a technology perspective or we will just go in. We will go in, but I think we'll go in less. And I think we will go in for different reasons. People keep saying we're going to go in for to collaborate and to be creative and to sit with our teams, but actually all I've seen are businesses just create less seats so that they can get less people in safely. But yeah. what they've not actually done anything with the office space, they've not created collaboration spaces or places to have those uh, random interactions. Actually nothing's changed. It's just every other seat is out of, out of action. And again, I don't know what your experience has, has been of it. So COVID's created havoc, I think with um, your normal working pattern and your expectation, but I think it's changed things forever. Um, I think you're probably now only going for two or three days a week because I think people will now look at their week and think, I don't need to go in on Tuesday because I can do all of that productively from home. Um, now, everybody's home environment or lockdown environment is different. You might be 20 living in a, a shared house and you don't want to be at home. You want to be in the office. So I think it's important to create um, and there's obviously mental health um, issues as well. You know, we've all suffered. I've certainly suffered with it. I'm missing the connection with people. Uh, but I think it's about um, 
giving people that safe environment to come back into and making that environment optimal to what they need. Um, so I think how can smart buildings help with that? I think it's about getting people in and out safely. Um, so again, it's that contactless experience. It's the, even as a visitor, it, it's just QR codes. It's destination control lifts. It's door, you know, door openings. It's, um, from an operator's perspective, understanding that actually we need to clean a little bit more in the high density areas. So uh, it'd be great for building operators to understand kind of um, heat map occupancy, heat maps where people are, uh, how long they've been there. And if it's showing up as red and purple, right, do you know what? We need to clean these surfaces a little bit more. Because again, if I'm a user of that space and I see that going on and I perhaps see that kind of data on community boards as I'm walking into a building, I think, yeah, these guys have really got it. They're, they're on top of the cleaning regime uh, but then when i get into the office i then want my my employer and uh, you want krish making sure that um you know that the environment you're working in is safe so if you're working in a meeting room you know is that air quality being measured is it being you know you know if it is higher or, or if we start off having a two-person meeting and then another couple of people move come in with us what's the impact on that air quality so perhaps you know, it'd be great if the hvac could um could, could switch up a, a, up a notch and start you know flushing in some more uh, some more cool air uh, or clean air but then you know you've got to make sure that you've got the capabilities to do it but if you've not in a mechanically ventilated office then you know wouldn't it be great again avm technology to, to just put a red band an led band around the screen that just says just starts to go a little bit red or a philips hue bulb because a bit red what we would call a behavioral nudge so you're basically saying jack the room's a little bit um, you know, it's getting a bit stuffy now. The air quality is a bit poor. So you might just be encouraged then to go and open the window. So that's great. You know, it, it, it's yeah. just little behavioral nudges like that, that, that let you know that um, by, by doing this, by reacting, that the environment is a little, a little bit safer. And I want to be at a book a seat. You know, I want to, you know, I think you need to make it easy for people to come in because you can't just wander in now and be guaranteed a seat. So you need that app. You need that, that way of, be able to book a seat and perhaps book a seat next to the guy you want to speak to or the girl you want to speak to that day to encourage that kind of, of, of collaboration. You want your meeting rooms to be easy to walk in and, uh, and to have those, you know, those teams meetings or whatever it might be, you know, that seamless experience, which I know you guys, uh, you know, you, you're really heavily, heavily invested in, but you've got to put the, the user at the heart of everything that you do right now, specifically with, 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 with COVID because people expect it. And frankly, if you go in and it's not right or it's not simple and you've not got, you don't feel like your employer's um, got your best interests of heart, it's another reason not to go in. And and that's that's what, that's really what they want to avoid, isn't it? Uh, yeah. What's your experiences been of it? Have you been going in? Have you been, or um, people you know, friends and family, have they, they, have they had something similar? I've been coming in part-time, um, so two days a week as opposed to five. Um, so obviously the footfall in the office is reduced. Um, same off the back of that, a lot of the things that you're saying will obviously reduce. So the air quality would increase, I would imagine, because you've got less people in the office. Um, there's less contact on everything, obviously. So the reduction in the chance of you catching something from someone else is obviously there. Equally, the element of seeing less people. So you, I'm only seeing specific people on set days as opposed to perhaps everyone. Um, something I was going to sort of add to what you were saying, Paul, was taking things out of the commercial environment and putting them more into the residential environment. Do you think that there could be a change in smart buildings in the respect of more people are working from home? So say you had um, a apartment building in the centre of Manchester. Do you think you'll maybe perhaps find those working spaces coming into the residential environment. What you mean, resi providers providing almost a co-working suite yeah. places for you to go and work without actually leaving your building. I, yeah, so I instead of having an office. I think hotel, I think if you look now, I can't remember the hotel brand, but they're offering hotel rooms very cheaply for the day, almost at co-working rates because they need yeah. actually people in there. They know you're going to use the mini bar, um, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but no, I, th I think you will. It's that hub and spoke model, Jack. I think there's a really great opportunity where 
I, I worry for city centres. I think they're going to need completely reimagining. Um, yeah. I think that they're going to be impacted by such a small footfall, but where there are risks, there are opportunities for other people. And I think I've certainly found, you know, I, I live um, in Altrincham that way, you know, in Timpoli, there's, there's the coffee shops there. As a result, there's you or I still working at home. I'm going to go down there and get lunch. I'm going to go down there and grab that coffee. Um, so there's, there's, there's more places, I think, um, uh, to be now without you being in the city centre. But I, I think you're absolutely right, Jack. I think resi, um, hotels, um, you know, you, you, there, there are stations, um, coffee, I mean, but people have worked in coffee shops for a long time. But I think you'll also find property um, owners moving out into the regions a little bit more where you've got great, you know, traffic hubs where yeah. perhaps you can get the tram for, you know, 20 minutes rather than going into the city centre that might take you half an hour or 40 minutes, or you could walk to it perhaps, uh, and yeah. then you might just find more shared space as a result. So then, again, you're getting that interaction, you're getting that, um, you, you're meeting other people, you know, you're having interesting conversations that you might not have had just, just sat at home because, frankly, I'm bored. I, I, I'm very lucky I've got a small little office. It drives me mad because I sit here in the day and then at night, this is where I also come to, murder some song on the, on my guitar <laughs> or listen to music or you know you just whatever you're doing you're shopping yeah. or well there is and i sit in this room all day and now i've got the the damn dog in with me as well it's becoming even more claustrophobic so <laughs> i would want to get out and i think if there's a if there's a facility for me to go if i was in a resi block and there was um co-working or an event space or breakout space i would absolutely use it yeah. without, without a shadow of a doubt i would use it and connect with other people and you've got obviously Master that sort of mental um kind of benefit to it then as well haven't you oh hugely hugely no these things drive you mad don't they? these teams meetings for i think the more you get you're more fatigued after a couple of these than you would be if you had a an all day an all day yeah, yeah. and i think i think i kind of uh, personally agree with you what you're saying paul i think it's it's never going to be how it used to be but i feel it's going to be more of a hybrid hybrid approach where some people will be working more from home but people are still going to go in the offices you know the office aren't office spaces are not going away they're just going to nope. adapt and how they are and maybe you know potentially instead of a business taking a whole floor um they might take half a floor but then another business will take half a floor but at the same time a business might just space out the flooring so they might still have you know the same physical square feet but they just might be you know more separate desks so they might have more breakout rooms or more um you know other spaces it's just being yeah, used be more, differently uh... There'll be more flexible space as a result. Yeah. You might sell less yeah. conventional long-term lease, but you might therefore just generate more um, flexible space. Because the other beautiful thing about it, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Leesman, um, but I encourage anybody that wants to know more about um, customer engagement and customer satisfaction to to look to look at the Leesman reports they do, and they've got some really interesting studies. It's a worldwide study about um, pre and post COVID. Um, but even even last year when I was looking at some of that data, the one thing your open plan office, which everybody has, <laughs> the one thing that that doesn't give you is a place to for quiet, productive time to, to sit and do that, that read that thing or have yeah, this yeah. call. You've yeah. not got places to do personal productive work. Whereas um, if you as a as a as a as a property landlord, you start to create more flexible space for your customers, you're going to be creating places for people to do productive yes. work so i think yeah. it's a win-win-win uh, yeah 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 but for yeah. everyone um, as yeah. a result you know you might you're not going to sign somebody up for five years you might do it on a day rate but that's how we all consume services i might want to work there tomorrow and i might have only decided that in the morning so i want to be able to book it on an app and walk in and, and have a great experience and feel like i'm part of a community and i think that's what flexible space will give you and i think you're going to see a lot more of it there's already a fair amount of it out there, but I just think it's going to get better. And I think there's going to be more smaller operators getting into this space because they're not going to need to lease an entire building or buy an entire building to do it. It's, it's, it's the WeWork model, isn't it? But I think just better. I think you're going to get some really interesting startups because the digital natives, these guys and girls that uh, I don't know what year that makes them, but those digital natives that spend hours seven hours on a phone um it's probably you jack i'm gonna say be careful what you're saying here paul <laughs> <laughs> but you you consume everything on your phone so you're not interested in going onto a website and signing up putting your bank details in you want it to be two clicks bop bop 
And I think there's going to be some really great flexible operators that are going to create a great experience for us as consumers of yeah. that space to go and join a community for a day, for a week, for a month, or whatever. And on flexible terms, and get everything we need to be productive without Because don't forget, work is something you do. It's not somewhere you go. It's another uh, dreadful phrase, isn't it? Uh, but it is, and that, that's what summarizes it for me. We could all arrange to meet tomorrow, you know, in, but we should be at a bucket there and then on the way in. Because that's how we consume things now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's interesting because um, I think with everything you've mentioned, a key word that keeps coming back is experiences. And I think with technology and data and you know smart buildings, all that's doing is actually improving experiences, and especially the way we work and the dynamic changes with the market. You know, it's it's just going to mean that we need better data to have better experiences. It's experiences um, and flexibility. Yeah. They're yeah. they're the really key things that I think customers want right now. And at the end of the day, the customer's voice is is louder than ever. You know, and I think if you're providing space no matter what it is if you're a hotel or resi a school a university uh, convention offices you have to be you have to have a customer centric approach and it has to be flexible um, yeah definitely i think definitely. that's what covid's taught us all now because yeah yeah we're now thinking we've got so many more options places to work and and, and the way we work so you if you can um and that if, if you can choose a product that, that the experience is just seamless, you're going to do it. You're yeah, gonna... no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I'm just being a bit cautious of time um, here. I think we've just kind of got into the flow of it all, Paul, because it's been so interesting for, for all of us. Um, Let me, Jack... uh, quickly show you my dog before you leave. Yeah, yeah no problem, yeah. <laughs> I said, Jack, if you've got any uh, questions you want to ask, we can get one or two in, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, sure. Oh, a, a nice, nice puppy there. What, what, what breed is that, Paul? Uh, she is a Cavapoo. Uh, I had no choice in it. I've just paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just chief babysitter. Nice <laughs> yeah, you take yeah. care, of, take care of her as well. She's my co-working uh, sweet yeah. uh, partner today. Yeah, co-worker. <laughs> um. So yeah, one of one of the main questions I actually had about the smart buildings was how are they integrated with natural environments? So, for example, natural lighting and plants and things like that is. Are they geared towards that in some respect? Um, I think it will interact. It, it will coexist with it. I think certainly smart lighting has been around for, for quite some time. So, you know, if, if you look at lighting now, you can for relatively inexpensively retrofit it or you can put it in from, from the start and it, it will start to give you that personalization again, which is another word that, is used heavily when you talk about experiences for customers. So if you want a certain brightness or luminosity, um, then you've got that control via an app because basically every light becomes an addressable device in the building. Um, so you can look at lamp life, how long it's been switched on, what its current state is. Um, and then obviously if you're sat on the south side of the building in the afternoon, most of the lights on the perimeter would switch off because you know it, it's yeah. just that daylight harvesting elements to it. So there is an element where it will interact with with with, with things like that. Um, and obviously, when nobody's in the building, there's nothing worse than driving past a building at night and seeing all the lights on. Is that no. it just seems like the most simplest sustainability thing to to get right? Yeah, it does. But, again, we don't. We're not brilliant at the basics, are we? Um, another term I use a lot: uh, being brilliant at the basics. So. It, it, it will interact with, with with things like that, Jack. You know, plants, I'm not an expert. Again, I've, it's cropped up in a couple of seminars I've been to when they've talked about air quality. All I'm going to say is you need a lot of them to, to yeah. create the kind of experience people expect. People will put one pot plant on the desk and be like, oh, it's so much better. Yeah, yes. <laughs> changes I'm nothing. A little bit skeptical. I'm a little bit skeptical about that. And there'll be oh, somebody, I'm sure, that there you go. There I you thought go. you looked healthy. There you go. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> But I think it, it's, it's not almost how it, it's how it makes you feel. I think when you go into a building and they've got the big green walls, I just think it's how it makes you feel. Yeah. It's bringing the outside inside, isn't it? And that that's not to be uh, to be ignored. And I, I like that. Um, but uh, and, it, and it brightens up the spaces as well, isn't it? But what its health advantages are, um, I'm, I'm I'm not too sure. But yeah. it makes you feel that there's a health advantage. Well, that's what my um, that's what my curiosity was because obviously green walls seem to be a trend at the moment, don't they? You seem to yeah. see them 
in quite Bio a lot Felix, of Bi- yeah biophilic design yeah yeah and they as you said they look very nice but what actually is the benefit of them aside from aesthetics and potentially obviously making you feel I think, good I, I think there is um well, i don't know what it is what is minute but i'm sure i'm sure there is because i think there is research and studies and businesses set up there to no, there to cater yeah. for that yeah. yeah yeah the guy the people i was talking about before and i couldn't remember the name is hilson moran i do apologize but those guys are based in neo in manchester and they're um well um engineering company and can advise you on it and if they do the plants jack so if you've got questions about a green wall <laughs> then reach out to uh, around they're really they're really good at what they do and if you get an opportunity in manchester to go and see them they'll take you into their offices and you'll get that um stood on the mountaintop feeling like i did skipping uh, through a really good at what they do <laughs> no it sounds it sounds great um i, I think we could probably talk talk for uh, maybe days i think by the sounds of things um there's so much interesting stuff with with technology and how it's being used. And Paul, I really love the examples and the use cases you've given because I think there's a lot of it. Uh, personally, I would never have thought of you know using data in that way. Yeah. You know, and looking at you know heat maps and where you should clean with during COVID and touchless technology and even the, the classic example of the, the loo roll we talked about. You know how from that it can be something completely different. And I think you know it's, it's quite amazing and fascinating. I could just see you know. With technology adapting there's so much possibility in the future that that's what i said earlier the, the biggest challenge is getting people to think differently so that's what i'm i'm trying to do in in the, in the business i've got is it, just helping taking people on that journey and letting them understand what it what it means to them or what it could mean to them and then once people start to think about it you're off then and then you know you it, it, you, you generally have some really interesting conversations but yeah at the end of the day if you're not doing it if you're not building a smart enable building, you you everybody's going to be doing it in the next two to three four years. You're going to get left behind. So my message is to do it and do and start thinking about it now. Uh, yeah. And if you don't know the answers, that's not a problem because that's where a lot of people start. It, it, it's this is very new and it does require a different way of thinking. But um, start that conversation ideally with me. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I've, I've got say- a puppy to feed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was going to say, Paul, if, if somebody does want to learn more, you know, what's the best way for them to get in touch and to have a word with you? Um, I'm sure Jack can flash my uh, contact details up when he's edited edited this, but uh, it'd just be to reach out to me probably on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way and, and, and a mechanism everybody's used to. Um, my email is paul at pj3projects.co.uk um, and you can follow me on Twitter, Paul D. Bamba, uh, but I'm sure Jack will put it all up. Yeah, we'll yeah, be able to get we'll, on the screen. We'll put all the um, details in the description of the YouTube video. We'll put everything in there. But no, I think on that note, um, just want to say a huge thank you, Paul, for joining us on, on today's session. And it's great no, speaking to you. And I'm, I'm sure maybe we might need a second session one day to talk about <laughs> everything else. And you can give us an update on how your puppy training has been going, going as well. Well, we've had no accidents that I can see. <laughs> so, yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, brilliant. No, um, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Jack, thanks again for co-hosting with me. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks both of you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Cool. See you later, guys. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the AV Huddle. Don't forget to like, comment, follow, and subscribe to get the latest AV updates. AV Huddle, powered by AVM Solutions.